Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Namaste. Today we begin the 12th module, which is case studies. In this module will have three lectures, economics of protected areas, economics of environmental disasters, part one and part two. So let us begin with the economics of protected areas. Protected areas are defined under section 24A of the Wildlife Protection Act 1972 as protected areas means a national park, a sanctuary, a conservation reserve or a community reserve notified under sections 18, 35, 36A and 36C of the Act. So the protected area is uh, a national park, a sanctuary, a conservation reserve or a community reserve and we have a number of wildlife that are found in the protected areas. So what is, what is wildlife? Wildlife is defined in the Wildlife Protection Act 1972 as wildlife includes any animal, aquatic or land vegetation which forms part of any habitat. So what we are saying here is that if you have any animal or any plant that forms part of any habitat then we will say that it's a wildlife. And the dictionary definition of wildlife is wild animals collectively or the native fauna and sometimes flora of a region which means that it is saying that the, the native fauna which is the native animals and the native flora which is the native plants so those animals and those plants that are found natively or which are indigenous to an area if we look at a collection of those we'll call it wildlife now wildlife are divided into uh, these nine uh, threat categories by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources. So we have a red list of different organisms which tells us what is the level of threat. So for certain organisms, whether plants or animals, the level of threat is so large that if we do not protect those animals and plants, then in a short while, it is very likely that these plants and animals will become extinct. On the other hand, there are certain plants and animals that are not that threatening. So in that case, we may not protect them to such a high extent or let us say that it is not an urgency to protect them right away. So these uh, threat categories are extinct. So if an organism is extinct, it means that there is nothing much that we can do about it. This organism just does not exist anymore. So things such as the dinosaurs or the dodo bird are currently extinct. They are no longer found in this world. Certain other organisms are extinct in the wild, which means that we may have a few specimens of these organisms, say in a zoo, but if you look out in the wild conditions, we do not have any of these organisms left. Then we have critically endangered organisms, endangered, vulnerable, near threatened and least concern. So an organism that is in the least concern, such as the common dog or the cow, we do not need to, uh, to provide them with the level of protection that is urgently required for say, a critically endangered species, such as a tiger. Then for a number of organisms, we do not have the data. So we categorize them as data deficient. And then we also have certain organisms that have not yet been evaluated and we call them not evaluated. So there are several species that are in need of conservation and the higher a species is on this list, the more is the amount of conservation that it urgently needs. Now this list gives us an idea of how do we prioritize things. Now, if you'll remember, it is a principle of economics that there are trade-offs involved in a number of things. 
well, we would ideally want to conserve each and every of these organisms, but then our time is limited, our resources are limited. So, if we have to spend our time and resources, we should prioritize which are those species that require a greater amount of conservation and those species for which we can actually do something. So, a scientific way of looking at which species to conserve looks at whether or not they are keystone species. Now, keystone species play critical ecological roles, which means that they have an importance that is much greater than their numerical abundance in an ecosystem. So, things such as off-season fruit-bearing trees are keystone species. So, what we mean by a keystone species is that the impact that these organisms have on an ecosystem is much greater than their numerical abundance. So, if there is a forest that is completely dry and this forest is having a scarcity of food, but then if you have a tree that can provide food to different uh, animals and birds, then this tree would act as a keystone species. Because even though you have a single tree that is providing the food, it is able to support a large variety of plants and animals. And keystone species include species such as the ficus trees, banyan trees, people trees. So these are those trees that provide food in the off season and also their uh, leaves, their branches, they are all edible and they are large in size. So if you have a look at a banyan tree, a banyan tree would be supporting say hundreds of organisms from small insects to reptiles to birds. So these sorts of species are known as keystone species. Another keystone species is the tiger. Because if you have a tiger in an area, then the tiger regulates the number of herbivores that are there. So the herbivore population is not able to uh, cross a threshold. Because if there are too many herbivores, then it is possible that they will eat up all the vegetation in the area and the whole ecosystem would collapse. So species that are keystone species need to be given a greater priority when we talk about conservation. Other species are known as umbrella species. These are species with large home ranges. So what happens in the case of these species is that they have such large home range requirements that if you make it a point to conserve these species, all the other species in the large home range will automatically get conserved. So here we have species such as the elephant or again the tiger. So an Amur tiger has a home range of around 800 square kilometers. In India, we have tigers that have home ranges of roughly 80 square kilometers. So if you are conserving the tigers, so for each tiger, roughly 80 square kilometers of area automatically gets conserved all the different uh, uh, organisms that live in that 80 square kilometers are automatically afforded protection because we are conserving the tigers. Or species such as the elephants, they also have large ranges. So the species that have very large home ranges, they act like an umbrella to provide protection to a large number of species just because uh, these umbrella species get protected. So again, they should get priority when we are talking about conservation. And the third is flagship species. Flagship species are well-known charismatic species that have captured the public's heart and won their support and funds for conservation. Examples include the giant panda, the humpback whale, the gorilla. So when we talk about flagship species, these are those species that attract people. So it is possible that a few of these species are beautiful species, such as the peacock. So peacock is a flagship species because it's beautiful. People want to see peacocks. Or you could have species that are very majestic, such as the tiger. So a tiger becomes a flagship species because people are in the awe of seeing a tiger. Or you could have species that have religious significance, such as the elephants. Now, these species that are the flagship species, they occupy a space in the hearts of people. And so when you want to conserve these species, it is easy to get funds. It is easy to get public support. So those species that the public likes, 
should also be given a higher priority in conservation. So these are the flagship species. Now, when we do conservation, we try to look for those species that meet all these three definitions. So if there is a species that is a keystone species, which means that it is uh, having a very large role in the ecosystem. It is an umbrella species, which means that it requires a large home range, which would automatically give protection to a large number of other species. And if it is also a flagship species, which means that people want to conserve this species, they are, and it is easy to get funds and public support. Nothing like it. So we always look for those species that are at the confluence of all three of these. A good example is the tiger. So because a tiger is a keystone species, it's a flagship species, and it's also an umbrella species. So by protecting tiger or by allocating funds for the conservation of tiger, we are able to achieve a lot of our goals of conservation. Now, in this context, it is prudent to re-memorize why are these species threatened? Why are we doing this conservation at all? Why are we setting up these protected areas? So we had seen earlier that there are a number of factors that lead a species to extinction. So there are factors that act at large population sizes and there are factors that act at smaller population sizes. And we can summarize these factors with the acronym HIPPO, habitat loss, invasive species, pollution, human overpopulation and overharvesting are the factors that have been driving species towards extinction. And when we are talking about protected areas, they protect the animals and plants that are inside from these five things. Now, when we want to protect species against these factors of extinction, there are two modes that are there with us. We can either take the species out from the natural environment and give them a, a very high level of protection, say in a zoo. So what happens in a zoo is that you bring the animals from the natural environment, you keep them in controlled conditions where they get sufficient amount of food, sufficient amount of water, and a very good veterinary care. So that is one way. The other way is that you can protect these species when they are out there in their natural environment. So that brings us to two modes of conserving wildlife. We can go for an ex situ conservation, which is conservation which is off the site. That is conservation outside the natural habitat, such as in the case of zoos or aquaria. Or we can have in situ conservation, which is conservation on the site, which means that conservation done that is within the natural habitat, such as a national park. So how do these work? So in the case of ex situ conservation, it is required for critically endangered species because it provides urgent intervention. So in the case of critically endangered species, because the numbers are so low that we need to give them a very high level of intervention, a very intensive management, which may not be possible in the wild conditions. So ex situ conservation is probably the only way out to conserve those species that are critically endangered. So in the case of ex situ conservation, we designate areas with suitable conditions and we create facilities. So in the case of ex situ conservation, an area will be selected, uh, say for making of a zoo, and then we'll create the facilities for a zoo. That is, we will uh, surround this area with say a wall, we will provide uh, means of, of bringing in water, means of bringing in food, we will create facilities such as a veterinarian's office, uh, say an operation theater and things like that. And once these are done, the species are moved into these designated areas for their survival and breeding. And in a number of cases, we also do uh, ex situ breeding of these animals, the captive breeding of animals. So what will, what is done is that these animals that are critically endangered, they are brought into these zoos and they are allowed to breed. And when the population goes up, then it is also uh, possible that we can later release them into their natural habitats. So that is ex situ conservation. 
It has a number of advantages. It pro allows better control of variables such as climate, diseases, diet, and so on, because it's a small area. The intervention is much more intensive, and so it is much easier to provide them with standardized conditions. It provides opportunity for close observation to better understand the species and the proximate causes of its extinction. So it provides us with an opportunity to understand the behavior of animals. So suppose in a zoo environment, you get to know that this animal avoids breeding if it is exposed to too much of sunlight. Then probably when we release these animals back into the natural environment, we will make sure that we release them into an area that has a very good canopy cover. So such kinds of observations are extremely indispensable when we want to conserve the organisms. And then they also permit intensive interventions such as in vitro fertilization, embryo transfer and so on. So we can provide all sorts of modern uh, scientific advancements and medicines to these organisms. However, it also has certain disadvantages because we are taking the animal out of its natural habitat and we are conserving those few animals, but in this process, we are not conserving the habitat. So it is possible that you remove all of the critically endangered species, uh, uh, individuals from the, uh, from the natural environment, bring them to a zoo, do a captive breeding, but in the meantime, their natural habitat gets destroyed completely. So that would defeat the purpose. So this is one disadvantage. Then it can be planned for only a few species at a time. Why? Because it is very expensive. You are doing an intensive intervention. So the costs go up. And when the costs go up, then it is difficult to do it for a very large number of species or a very large number of individuals. Some wild behaviors may get lost. Why? Because we are not keeping the organisms in a wild setting. And so it is possible that while a few of these organisms are able to survive and breed, but they will lose out on their natural behaviors, like where to look for food or how to hunt. So this is another disadvantage. Captive bred and raised individuals may then find it difficult when they are reintroduced because they are now completely dependent on human intervention. They do not know how to hunt for a food. So in that case, once you try to release them back into the environment, it is possible that they will just not be able to cope with the conditions. Then it may increase the chances of inbreeding if it is not planned properly. If the stud books are not maintained properly, it is possible that brothers and sisters or parents and offspring might breed with one another. And in that case, the number of recessive disorders will go up. And then finally, it is also costly. Now, throughout this course, we have observed that price or cost act as very good indicators about different activities. So if it is costly and uh, money is one input that you are able to provide, then you'll have to also look at the trade-off. Can this money be better spent in protecting the habitat? than in setting up of a zoo. So these kinds of questions need to be answered. Examples of ex situ conservation include zoos, aquaria, captive breeding facilities, botanical gardens, bamboo seta, arboreta, seed banks, cryopreservation facilities such as tissue culture, sperm banks, ova banks, and so on. So in all of these, what we are doing is that we are taking the organism or its body parts away from the natural setting and keeping them in a very scientifically managed facility, providing a very intensive intervention with the hope that probably someday in the future, we will be able to release them back into the environment once the numbers have gone. So this is ex situ conservation. The other mode of conservation is in situ conservation, which is conservation on the site. So in this, areas in the natural habitat are designated as reserves, national parks or protected areas. And in these, ecological monitoring and interventions such as active management are done and legislations are required to maintain these areas as protected areas. 
So what we do in the case of in situ conservation is that first of all, we designate a place as an in situ conservation facility, such as a national park or a wildlife sanctuary or any other modes of protected areas. Now, different countries may be using different terms, but you get the idea. So the first step is to use legislation to designate an area as a protected area or as an in situ conservation area. Once you have done this, this designation, then laws will be used to ensure that people do not enter into this area or to regulate the movement of people into this area. And also we, we do active intervention that is active management such as control of forest fires or control of invasive species or provisioning of water. So all different kinds of active management are also done in these areas. It provides several distinctive advantages. The species continue to live in their natural environment, which means that the natural behaviors are maintained in these areas. Then this is less disruptive and more importantly, it is less costly because the only cost that is involved is doing a legislation to, to designate these areas as protected areas and probably do a bit of protection, a bit of habitat planning. You do not have to set up facilities such as uh, a veterinarian's office or an OT or cages for individual organisms. You do not have to bring in food from outside to feed these organisms and so on. So it is much less costly as compared to an ex situ conservation facility. Then protection of the natural habitat provides protection to other species as well. So if you are say uh, trying to conserve tiger by creating a tiger reserve, then not only is the tiger protected, but also the other species that live in the forest, they also get protection automatically. Whereas if you were trying to conserve tigers using ex situ conservation facilities, you would have brought the tiger outside, you would have conserved the tiger, but when its habitat gets destroyed, then the other species will also be in a peril. And so a distinctive advantage of in situ conservation is that it provides protection to other species as well. Then even in the case of ex situ conservation, the animal will need to be released somewhere in some point of time. So once you have done the captive breeding in the case of ex situ conservation, you have now large number of animals, so they will have to be released back into the environment. Now, if you only did ex situ conservation, you only maintained these individuals in the zoos and their natural habitats got destroyed. In that case, where would you, you release these organisms? So in situ conservation is also uh, important together with ex situ conservation because it keeps certain portions of the habitats of on these organisms as intact so that you can release them there later on. So these provide suitable areas for such releases. And they also double as places for scientific studies and public awareness and things such as tourism. The disadvantages include requirement of very large areas because in the case of uh, in situ conservation, what we are doing is that we are designating very large areas as protected areas. So this, the area requirement or the land size requirement is much greater. In the case of ex situ conservation, such as a, a zoo, you can keep animals at a much greater density. But in the case of in situ conservation, such as a tiger reserve or say a national park, you will have to keep these animals uh, in the natural settings in which case it will require a much greater area. There is less intensive protection and management because the areas may be encroached upon or the animals may get forced. Why? Because these areas are so large that it is not possible for you to man all of this area at all times. So it is possible that a poacher might get into a national park and kill a few of your animals which is very difficult in the case of an ex situ conservation facility because you have erected huge works. And also because in the case of an intensive intervention, it is uh, very easy to keep an eye on each and every animal. Probably you could even make use of CCTV cameras. But in the case of uh, in situ conservation, this becomes difficult because the area is so huge. Then there are always the threats of diseases and disasters. Because it's a large area, you are not able to manage everything at all points of time. 
and a large establishment is required in each case. Establishment in terms of people who are going to man the area, establishment in terms of vehicles, because these are large areas, so you have to go to, to different areas to uh, observe these animals, to protect these animals. In that case, you might even require, say, forest rest houses in certain locations. So, a large amount of establishment may also be required in the case of in situ conservation. Now, when we say that we are going to do an in situ conservation, there are certain traditional ways of creating the protected area. How did uh, the kings of the bygone eras used to make a protected area? So, one option was to look for beautiful areas. So, if an area is a beautiful area, the king would say, okay, these are such beautiful areas, let us make them into a national park. So, lush green mountains, lakes, beaches, they used to be converted into protected areas for the enjoyment of the king. In certain cases, certain high species diversity areas used to be converted into protected areas, such as the Silent Valley National Park in Kerala. Or in certain cases, those areas that harbor unique animals, endemic organisms that are found nowhere else, would be converted into protected areas, such as the Gir National Park in Gujarat, that is the only home of Asiatic lions in India. But in a number of cases, these become a bit too haphazard and based on the whims and fancies of the reserve creator. So, with time, we have shifted from these traditional ways of creating protected areas to the scientific ways of creating protected areas. In the scientific way, we look for those areas that are high in species richness, species endemism, and that have a moderate level of threat, of threat to the species. So what is species richness? Species richness refers to those areas where you have more number of species per unit area. So if we look at say things like global mammalian richness, there are certain areas that have a large number of species per unit area and there are certain areas that have a less number of species per unit area. So we can look at global mammalian richness or we can look at amphibian richness. Then we can also look at the number of species that are under threat. So there are certain areas such as in the Southeast Asia that have a much greater level of threat than say um, an area in North America. Then uh, we can also have a look at uh, different categories of species such as the number of amphibian species in death threat. So what we do is that we look for those areas that have high species richness which means these areas have large number of uh, organisms and if you create a protected area in one of these locations then you will be able to uh, afford protection to a very large number of species because these are the areas with high species richness. We look for those areas that have a high degree of endemism. So if an organism is only found in one area, you will have to provide it protection in that area. Because if you do not do that, that species will become extinct very soon. And we look at those areas that have a high degree of threat or at least a moderate degree of threat. Because if we have an area that say does not have any threat, say an island that nobody ever goes to. So in that case, because our time, money and resources are limited, then it is much more prudent to make uh, a protected area probably in a threatened region than this island. Because even if you did not convert this island into a protected area, the species would have uh, remained fine. There would not have been any difference or there is no impact of making a protected area in such a location. So we look for these three criteria and those areas which have all these three high degree of richness, endemism and threat, we call them as biodiversity hotspots. So these are the biodiversity hotspots in the world and in our country areas such as the western Ghats are a biodiversity hotspot because we have a very large number of species that live in these areas. So there is a very good amount of species richness. We have a number of species that are only found in the Western Ghats, such as a number of the amphibian species. So there is a very great amount of species endemism. And the Western Ghats are also threatened because people want to cut these forests and convert them into certain other uses. 
So in that case, these areas also have a high degree of threat. So these areas that are the biodiversity hotspots, they need to be uh, afforded greater amount of protection. And in this case, we should also have a look at the threat triage that we have. So there is an area that has a very high degree of threat, then probably it's already a lost cause. Because by the time you would be able to convert this area into a protected area, maybe uh, set up mechanisms for the protection of this area, set up mechanisms for habitat management. By that time, because of the high level of threat, probably it would already been taken over. On the other hand, if you have a, a location that has a very low degree of threat, there too, it does not make any difference whether you make a protected area or not. Because the animals or the organisms in this area would remain fine whether you make a protected area or not. There is absolutely no threat in those areas. So the areas which have a very high degree of threat or the areas which have a very low degree of threat, they are not that preferred. But those areas that have a medium degree of threat, they are more preferred. Because in those cases, you will be able to put in a much greater impact by converting those areas into protected areas. So we need to keep in mind the threat triage as well. And we should also keep in mind the gap analysis. The gap analysis approach tries to identify holes in the existing network of protected areas that are primarily in locations that are or were historically uninhabitable for humans due to their heights, prevalence or diseases and so on. And creating some protected areas in human dominated areas may fill the gap, allowing a different set of species to thrive. Now, what we are saying here is that in, in the case of the existing network of protected areas, people normally went for those areas traditionally that were not of much use. So you would hardly find a protected area in uh, or near a town or a city. You would only find protected areas in those mountains that were very difficult to reach or those areas that were infested with mosquitoes and malaria because of which people did not want to go to, to those areas. So the, the rulers used to convert those areas into protected areas. Now, because we have inherited such protected areas, so a number of protected areas today are in those locations that are not that well within reach. Whereas those areas which were which could be dominated by humans such as the plain areas they were completely converted into agricultural lands now gap analysis says that we uh, that because uh, we created our uh, earlier protected areas in the mountains so we are able to protect the mountainous species but we did not create any protected area in the plain areas so if we have a chance, let us at least create a few protected areas in the plains or those locations that are human dominated. Because when we, once we do that, we will also be able to provide protection to the species that live, that live in plain areas or those areas that have become human dominated. So that is gap analysis. You take a map, mark out all the protected areas and look for the gaps. And those gaps are the areas where you should be making the newer protected areas. So that is the gap analysis. And whenever we are making a protected area, whenever we have the chance to make a protected area, there are certain principles of reserve design that should be kept in mind. Whenever you are making a protected area, go for a larger size. So big is better than small. Why? Because a bigger size means more number of habitats which means a higher species diversity that you will be able to afford protection to. If you make a very small protected area, then you will be able to provide protection to less number of species. There are less number of habitats. But if you are able to construct a large size reserve, then you will be able to provide protection to a large number of species that live in the diverse habitats that you have converted into the protected area. Second thing is that they are more secure and easier to manage per unit area. Why are they more secure? Because in larger areas, you have larger populations. If you have larger populations, then they are less susceptible to extinction because you will only have those factors of extinction working there that work at the larger population sizes. 
but the factors of extinction that work at smaller scales the stochastic factors will not work in these larger areas so the populations are inherently more secure from extinction then in the predicted areas you need to protect the perimeter because the perimeter is where people can get into whereas the species get protected in the area now as you increase the size of a protected area the ratio of perimeter to the area of uh, of this reserve it reduces which means that it becomes much more cost effective to provide protection to this reserve so the larger the uh, size of the reserve it has the smaller perimeter per unit area which makes protection more cost um, effective then these are also less vulnerable to catastrophes because smaller catastrophes will not impact the whole area another principle is that one big is better than several small of the same total area which means that if you have an option of making one big reserve or four smaller reserves or five smaller reserves and the total area is the same in both the cases you should probably go for the larger size one not a number of smaller ones why because these smaller ones will not be able to support those species with large home ranges so they will be only able to support those species that have smaller home ranges whereas this large area will be able to support those species that have smaller home ranges but also those species that have larger home ranges so one big is better than several small of the same total area but then if you cannot make one big one if you only have the option of smaller ones then go for those smaller reserves that are close to weather because they minimize isolation because what happens is if you have these reserves that are close by the animals may go from one area to the next area and in that case it may be able to support at least some of those species that have higher home ranges so closer species minimize isolation so they should be preferred those uh, reserves that are very far from each other they should be less preferred then you should go for a cluster approach if the species are together in the form of a cluster it is more preferred than a linear arrangement because in the case of a cluster approach the species from this reserve can go to this reserve and it can also go to this reserve the species in this reserve can go to this reserve but also to this reserve so the amount of movements increases whereas if you have the reserves that are lined up in a linear fashion then the organisms in this reserve can only go to this reserve so the movements are more restricted in a linear fashion and if possible go for a circular looking reserve because circular reserves have less biotic pressure which means that the influence of humans that are there in the periphery say if it reaches to this distance so at least the, this area in the center it will be protected so the core area of the reserve will be protected whereas if you have a reserve that is linear in structure in that case the influence of the humans in this place will probably go to more than half the uh, area of this uh, reserve and in that case everywhere you will find an influence of humans and so the level of protection in a linear reserve will be much lesser but then we also have a number of linear reserves and we have already observed that say in the case of the madubalai tiger reserve if you make a 10 km buffer from the habitations you will find that the whole of the reserve is completely covered with these buffer areas so the circular reserves need to be promoted more than linear reserves such as these and if nothing else happens at least maintain the connections because through these connections we can ensure that the organisms have a free movement and in that case some species that have larger home range requirements they will still get some level of protection but if we have these reserves in the form of islands what will happen is that in the absence of movement you will find a large amount of inbreeding in each of these different reserves and once that happens the level of protection goes down now 
we routinely make use of these approaches whenever we are making new protected areas so for instance in the state of madhya pradesh when we were looking for new sanctuaries we looked at biodiversity intactness now biodiversity intactness index tells us the level of biodiversity that remains in different areas so if you look at this map these sections that are darker in color they have more biodiversity these areas that have uh, a lighter color they have actually lost their biodiversity over the several years so whenever we are making a protected area we should ensure that there is a high level of species richness or the biodiversity so these areas which are dark in color need to be uh, selected then through a gap analysis we can look at those areas where you already have the reserves and make reserves in those areas that are away from these and when we try to maintain the connections what we do is that suppose you consider this reserve and this reserve so here you have the madhav national park and here you have the panna tiger reserve now we know that tigers take this route when they go from madhav to panna and in that case if you make a reserve here in the center then probably it will be much more effective than say creating a reserve here where the animals do not move so in this case we are making use of gap analysis we are making use of gap analysis to understand where we should be making these reserves so we try to maintain the connections we try to enhance the connection and we try to do it in a way where we can get the largest size areas and in those locations where we do not have the sanctuaries but we do have a uh, transit paths of animals now in the case of madhya pradesh tiger is uh, the most important animal in the terms of conservation because it is keystone flagship as well as umbrella species and so when we are focusing on tiger we should look at the routes that the tiger takes when it moves from one location to another so this is what was done to identify the locations where we can have newer sanctuaries now once we have looked at what a protected area is how do we make a protected area what is the importance of a protected area let us now have a look at the economic analysis of protected areas when we make a protected area what is the benefit that we can provide to people so which brings us to the ecosystem services from protected areas now ecosystem services are the services that are provided by a well functioning ecosystem in these protected areas ecosystem services are defined as the benefits that people obtain from ecosystems benefits again a cost benefit approach if you want to make a protected area you will have to convince people that it is going to be of benefit to the people so we have to do a computation of the benefits that we can provide to people whenever we are making a protected area so this is this is bringing us to the culmination of conservation economics and you can get an idea that to do conservation it is important to make use of economics to tell people that this project is going to be economically beneficial to the people especially because we are living in a democracy so it is very important to convince the politicians the policy makers that if you do if you do conservation and if you do good conservation you are going to provide benefit to the people of your state or or your country so this is uh, why a study of ecosystem services becomes very important now ecosystem services are divided into provisioning services in which case the ecosystem provides something in the form of materials such as food or medicines so if you have a well functioning ecosystem you can get hold of certain medicinal plants or you can get hold of certain amounts of food from this area so this is known as a provisioning service now this provisioning does not just mean that you can that you should allow people to get into the protected area and uproot these medicinal plants but what it is saying is that if you maintain your area as a protected area then a number of these species will also come out in the form of say seeds and through which you will be able to uh, get these resources for the people who are living in the vicinity so provisioning services include things like food and medicines we also have several regulating services such as the regulation of local climate 
the biological control of pest population and so on. So it has been seen that in areas that are close to the protected areas, the level of insect infestation is much lesser. Why? Because the protected areas harbor a large number and variety of birds. There will also be a, a large number of insectivorous birds. And these birds will provide protection to the farmlands that are near the protected area. So this is an example of a biological control over the pest. The farmers that live in the vicinity do not have to spend that much amount of money on uh, purchasing insecticides. So this is a regulating service. Another regulating service is the regulation of the local climate or the microclimate. So the areas that are close to the protected areas, they have a more amiable climate. It does not become that hot in summers. It does not become that cold in winters. So that is a regulating service in the form of climate regulation. Then these ecosystems also provide supporting services in the form of soil formation and nutrient cycling. They also provide several cultural services such as recreation, educational uses, religious uses. So these are different services that a well-functioning ecosystem provides to people. So we have provisioning services, regulating services, supporting services, and cultural services. And to do a valuation of these services, we can make use of economic models. Now, if you remember, a model is a simplified depiction of the reality. But the best thing about a model is that it allows us, it permits us to do computations in a simplified manner. So one such model is the INVEST model. INVEST is Integrated Valuation of Ecosystem Services and Trade-offs. An integrated valuation. So you are incorporating a number of variables to do an integrated valuation. Valuation of ecosystem services and also of the trade-offs that you need to make. Trade-off in terms of, say, if you have 100 rupees, if you spend these 100 rupees into the functioning of uh, a protected area, do you get, uh, say, 105 rupees out of it? Or do you lose 5 rupees and you only get 95 rupees in return? So that is a trade-off. You have certain amounts of funds. Every government has certain amounts of funds. And if the government uses them in uh, construction or maintenance of a protected area, then probably those funds cannot be used in other locations, say for healthcare or for education sector, or for setting up of a new industry, or for laying of new roads. So there is always a trade-off. Now the invest model helps us to understand that if we are putting 100 rupees into the functioning of uh, the ecosystem services because of making, say, a protected area or protecting a protected area, what is the return that we get out of it? So that is something that the invest model also tells us. So this is a GIS based suite. GIS is geographical information system. So in the case of GIS, we make use of the information about where different things are located, where the water sources are located. Are they located close to the villages or are they located in the interior of the protected areas, which would mean that they are far away from the villages. So these are the kinds of information that we make use of. Where does the river flow? Where are the hills? Where are the mountains? Where are the plains? And we make use of all such information. And because we are using the geographical information, so this is a GIS based suite of open source software models for mapping and doing valuation of ecosystem services. It performs computations using spatially explicit data and models. So the data and the models that, that we use are also based on where different things are located. They are spatially explicit. And the final results can be in the form of biophysical information, such as the terms of carbon that were sequestered, or you can get the results in the form of economic information. That is, what is the value of that amount of sequestered carbon? So you can uh, ask this model to give you a result of that so uh, that so much amount of tons of carbon dioxide were sequestered by this protected area in this year or it can give you what is the market value of that amount of sequestered carbon. 
similarly in the case of water resources similarly in the case of other uh, uh, services such as the providing or the supporting services so let us now have a look at what kinds of uh, services do we model here the first thing or the first ecosystem service that the protected area gives you is employment generation because there will be a large number of uh, uh, gypsy drivers that get employment there will be a large number of guides that get employment there will be portals that are set up because tourists are coming to this area now when the tourists come they will require n number of services and all of these provide employment to people now what is the amount of employment that the protection that the protected area generates is given as the sum of the number of man days into the wage rate so how many man days of employment was generated what was the rate at which these people got paid so you do a multiplication of both of these and you sum them up for all the people who are getting an employment because of the protected area so this is giving us a value of the employment generation fishing benefits which is the sum of production into the market prices now in some protected areas we do permit fishing especially in the buffer areas so if there is a buffer area and it is getting water from the protected area or it is a part of the protected area and it is also getting uh, benefited or protected because of the activities in the protected areas what is the amount of fish catch what is the market price of that fish so when you do a sum over the the production into market prices you get the fishing benefits we compute the fuel wood benefits again production into market prices fodder benefits production into market prices so we are doing all dif these different kinds of valuations timber benefits how much is the amount of timber that can be extracted especially in the buffer areas where we do permit extraction of timber production into market prices bamboo benefits production into market prices non timber forest produce now this includes things such as honey lac medicinal plants and so on so in the case of non timber forest produce you also have a market for honey you have a market for lac you have a market for the medicinal plants that you get out of the forest so here again we can do production into market prices the sum of all the ntfps that you are getting in this area gene pool benefits such as the resilience of ecosystems and avenues for future use of biological compounds or other products computed using benefit transfer method now we, what we are saying here is that if you conserve an area as a protected area you are making the ecosystems more resilient which means that if there is say um, release of pollutants into this area your ecosystem will not collapse that is the then uh, an an ecosystem that was say not given this protection because as we had seen in the case of large infrequent disturbances if a biological community is already disturbed or is already half disturbed and you give it a single disturbance and it will collapse but when you are maintaining a system as a protected area you maintain the organisms in this ecosystem in the best possible state and so they are much more resilient to any impacts or any disturbances such as uh say because of the release of pollutants or because of an oil spill or because of a forest fire so we get gene pool benefits in terms of resilience of ecosystems we also have avenues for future use of biological compounds and their products which means that if we have a new disease that comes up then we will have to look for medicines we will have to look for those compounds that can help us fight those diseases now a number of plants and animals have uh, have certain compounds that are known as metabolic compounds now these compounds can play a role in protecting us against the diseases a good example is the quinine that we get from this bark of cinchona tree now quinine is something that the plant manufactures not because it is an anti malarial but because it provides a certain degree of protection to the plant other animals do not eat that plant insects are less able to invade into this plant but then because this plant produces quinine and 
if humans get malaria they can make use of this bark to extract quinine to work as an anti malarial drug and a number of medicines such as artemisinin are also derived from different plant products now if we have a large amount of biodiversity there is a greater chance that we will have access to one or more of such compounds in the future when we need them so these are gene pool benefits the benefits that you are getting because you are maintaining a good gene pool and a good biodiversity now these kinds of benefits are computed using benefits transfer method which is a method to estimate the economic values for ecosystem services by transferring available information from studies already completed in another location and or context what this means is suppose in um, a protected area in some other country or in some other part of your country has been made to make a valuation of the kinds of benefits that we get to make an economic valuation of the benefits that we get then we can make use of such studies to incorporate the results to incorporate the results of the analysis that was done there into our protected area so that is known as a benefits transfer method so we can uh, compute the valuation of these gene pool benefits using the benefits transfer method so you do not have to to do a valuation at each and every protected area but in certain protected areas you can do a more intensive valuation and you can make use of those results in your protected area of study then we can find out carbon sequestration benefits which is the amount of carbon that is has been sequestered multiplied by the market prices or we can even make use of the social cost of uh, sequestering this carbon carbon storage benefits which is again total storage into the social cost of carbon what is social cost the cost of impacts that is caused by the emission of carbon dioxide so what we are asking is if we did not sequester this amount of carbon if we did not store this amount of carbon then this carbon would have been released into the environment it would have been there in the atmosphere it would have played a role in global warming and in climate change now because of climate change because of global warming there are a number of extreme climatic events we are seeing more floods more droughts and things like that now what is the social cost what is the cost that people are suffering because of that amount of carbon that is there in the atmosphere so that is the social cost of carbon so we can do carbon storage benefits as total storage of carbon multiplied by the the social cost of carbon we can look at water provisioning benefits what is the amount of clean water that is given by this uh, protected area multiply that with the market prices we can look at water purification benefits which is the water that is purified by a protected area multiplied by the average cost of treating water or we can look at soil conservation and sediment retention benefits the amount of erosion that was avoided by this protected area multiplied by the cost of damage that was avoided we can look at nutrient retention benefits the amount of nutrients that were retained multiplied by the cost of artificial fertilizers that would have been required if you were not retaining these nutrients biological control of pests computed using benefits transfer method modulation of extreme events benefits pollination benefits nursery for various species benefits habitat for various species benefits cultural heritage benefits recreation benefits air quality benefits water assimilation that is being done by the by the protected areas what is the benefit because of that what is the benefit for uh, because of regulation of climate so we can use it we can have a look at all these different ecosystem services that are being provided by the protected area and do an economic valuation of that now what sorts of results are obtained so if you look at uh, the valuation of panna tiger reserve we are getting a flow benefits of around rupees 70 billion in a year of which direct benefits are 0.78 billion indirect benefits are 53 billion option benefits are 15.65 billion stock benefits critical ecosystem services kinds of services so in total what we are getting is that we are having an investment multiplier so we can add up all of these different benefits 
and then we can figure out what is the investment multiplier. Now, what is an investment multiplier? An investment multiplier asks the question that if the government or if the public spend one rupee into the protected area, what is the return that they get in uh, uh, out of it? So, suppose the government invests one rupee in healthcare sector, then people are more healthier. If they are healthier, then there is an increase in the economic output. What is that level of economic output? What is the bang for the buck that we are getting? What is, are the benefits that we get? So for any investment, we can look at the investment multiplier. And here we are observing that the investment multiplier in the case of Panna Tiger Reserve is as high as 1939.36. Now this is especially because if you have a, a protected area, there are hardly any costs involved because you only have to maintain that area, minimal level of protection, minimal level of habitat intervention. But then the nature does everything else for you. So it is a very good uh, investment multiplier, meaning that it is a very good investment opportunity for any body. So that's all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.